All right, so just a couple questions for you all before we get started. How many of you all are really passionate about the environment? All right, I had a feeling that would get a lot of hands. How many of you all are committed to making your full-time job about helping make the world a cleaner and brighter place? Okay, pretty good, awesome. And how many of you all know exactly what you should do next to get started? Okay, a few less, which is what I, I thought there would be, but this panel is about trying to help you answer that question and envision what kind of career path you could go on next to help make the world environment even cleaner. And we've got three amazing panelists um, who are gonna share their stories with you today. So the first person is Anita Ahuja, who is the co-founder of Conserve India. Please welcome her to the stage. All right. Thank you. Next we have Sam Cochran, who's the co-founder of Sustainability Minded Interactive Technology, or SMIT. And finally, Roxanne Quimby, the co-founder of Burt's Bees. Welcome to my panelists. Um, so we wanted to start with talking a little bit about um, how each of these folks got started and what advice they would give to you all as well. Um, and then as you know from this morning session, this is going to be an interactive session. We're going to have questions from you all, group discussions. So please start thinking about the kind of questions that you'd like to engage our panelists on. Um, but first, Anita, I'd love to hear more about your organization. Give us the summary. What does your organization do? Um, I'm from Delhi. We basically pick up the waste from the streets of Delhi. And like any developing country, Delhi has got a lot of waste and all kinds of waste. There's plastic waste, cardboard, newspaper, glass, metals, name it, and it's there. So we pick up this waste, we segregate it, wash it, and make it into beautiful products. We have a waste lab, so all these materials go into the waste lab and where they are transformed. And then they go to all over the world. We participate in two fashion weeks, Milan and Paris. So the products from the waste, we call it upcycle products. And uh, the world has really accepted these products. So sometimes I don't know whether we created the market or the market created us, but we are here to stay. That's, that's amazing. And, um, and you have both an NGO and a company. Tell us a little bit about that. That's right. Uh, we started as an NGO in 98, and we were very grant uh, dependent. We used to get grants from various organizations. And then, but the projects weren't sustainable, because most of the time when you tailor a project for a funding agency, sustainability is not uh, really there, and you're not working towards it. So we decide, but we are committed to the communities that we work with. And uh, we felt at some stage a hybrid was more suited for our needs. We needed to grow, we needed money, and so we were interested in communicating with the investors. But the investors are not interested in investing in the NGO. They want a private enterprise, and that's how we came about being a hybrid. And a lot of these students have their own ideas. If they're probably wondering, should they start an NGO? Should they start a for-profit company? What advice could you give them on, on how to know the answer to that? It's a very difficult question. Because, uh, you know, I, uh, when you start an NGO, you're saying no to many good jobs that will come along the way. And uh, an NGO is when you want to work with the, for the community, while in a private enterprise there is scope for, uh, you know, saving at least some amount for yourself. So I find it is, it's on your personality. Either you want to work as in a non-profit field or you want to work in a for-profit field. Both the fields are equally good and both will lead ultimately to the, what you want to do for the community and the society. But this is a choice which comes from within. So each one of you have to take a walk and see what suits you best. So Conserve India is a, a brilliant and very creative idea. Uh, tell the audience a little bit about where the idea came from. Where, how did you think about this organization? We, st we were working in waste management projects. We were doing collection of household waste and the wet waste we were making compost. But there was a lot of other waste which was, which was going into the dumps. And in Delhi, the dumps means the back open streets. So we could see that uh, there's just garbage lying everywhere and plastic, particularly a lot of plastic, whether it was in the form of plastic bags or plastic bottles or broken plastic products, but there was a lot of plastic and we got involved with the rack picker community. In India, the rack picking community is the, 
is the poorest and the weakest. And they're completely unskilled. And we wanted to work with them. The funding agencies weren't very interested in cooperating on a project like that. So we decided to go to the market. And the market, in a way, is very kind if you come with a good product. We got amazing response at a very first trade show. And uh, we had buyers like Whole Foods and Crate and Barrel uh, talking to us about selling them the products. So I think the market is ready and willing. There's a lot, uh, during recession, we realized that the fair trade companies had done far better in recession than normal times, while the luxury brands had suffered a lot. So I think the people are ready, the market is ready. And in, especially in our developed world, we go and see the recycling centers are already there, there's space. All you need is a waste lab and some right products. The buyer and the markets are waiting. And on your journey of creating this amazing organization, was there any one person or one organization that was most helpful to you in getting launched and getting scale? Um, I mean, not on very good politically, but yes, I think Ashoka, uh, being Ashoka Fellow helped me. And USAID throughout, they have kind of stood with us. We get a lot of negative reports in the media about these two organizations, but yes, uh, we, Conserve has been considerably helped by them. And my final question for now is, do you have any openings for interns this summer? Oh, yes. I must say a word about interns. Since the time we started, we have worked a lot with interns. And I would say 80% of the success is due to the interns. We get designers. We get people involved in processes. We get ma even an intern to make our business plan. <laughs> so we have had interns at every step. And uh, we haven't really advertised. It's just word of mouth. And they all want an India experience. And this, I mean, I've really had amazing experiences. Like when I started the project, we work a lot with uh, the most of the rack pickers. Don't, uh, we have a caste system in India. They belong to the lowest caste. And it's very difficult for us to work with them. And uh, the rest, in, in India, we, ha we are born with this caste system ingrained in us. So it's difficult to bridge it. But when the interns come, they walk in with such idealism, with such dedication. They don't know anything about caste system. It really helped. You know, so many things just became natural when the intern was there. We just had to look at each other and smile, and everything would become easy. But otherwise, the anger of the sometimes facing the anger of the people and all can be very difficult. Great, thank you, uh, Sam. What's Solar Ivy? Give us the elevator pitch. Solar Ivy is a modular system of photovoltaic components that integrate into our built environment beautifully. Um, we've designed the system such that we can optimize the angle of instance of any photovoltaic leaf that's on any surface around the globe. So it's inspired by the plant Ivy, and we've created a software system that takes that idea and is able to replicate it with renewable energy. Uh, our company, Smit, has a number of products that are in development and two that are available. Solar Ivy is one of them. And Tensile Solar is the other, which is very similar in that we're able to customize the system for any location. Um, it's a system of modular photovoltaics that Com when comprised, create a tensile structure. Um, so it's really changing the ideas and the forms around what a solar panel can be and how it integrates into our world. Um, we really focus on material efficiency and trying to create systems that can be upgraded and recycled at the end of their life cycle. Um, we offer three different types of solar panels that have three different kind of carbon footprints in manufacture, but also different efficiencies for uh, cost effectiveness and uh, market viability. Uh, an organic photovoltaic, which has zero toxins within it, comes in many different colors and can be recycled at the end of its life cycle, all the way to a CIGS panel, which has the highest efficiency and um, the longest lifespan. So we are really looking at creating photovoltaics and wind products that are beautiful in their relationships to our world. That's great. How did you come up with that idea for the company? Uh, it was a, a combination of events. Um, there was the study of biology and plant life. Um, I come from an industrial design background, and our business partner comes from an architecture background, and our products kind of meet in the middle. Um, so when I was partnering with um, our other co-founder, Ben House, on this one product while I was still in school, actually, my senior year. 
um, I had this idea of how to maximize latent energy around us. Um, so understanding the sun and the wind patterns around a building gave an opportunity for a way to capture that energy in a, in a wholly different way. Um, and then the biomimetic ideas of ivy and how that plant interacts with our environment. It, it goes vertical to capture more resources. Um, and then also how it, it itself has a beautiful kinetic action of moving and fluttering in the wind. We're able to capture that and, and produce electricity from it. Um, so there was a lot of technology drivers that came together, um, some interest in how to change our interaction with our, with our environment, both in the materials that we use to create the products, but in also how those products get deployed and optimized in their, in their uh, use. Um, and, and so it was seeing technology come together, having these ideas of, of how a product could be developed and deployed, um, and then you know, finding the resources and kind of going through the entrepreneurial side of bringing those things together. Yeah, give us a quick summary of that process. Did you start with a business plan? How did that, how did that work? Uh, I started with the idea of a pro for a product, um, and actually our third business partner is my sister, uh, and she was going through a program um, at the NYU Tisch School, uh, which is the Intertidal Communications Program, and she was developing a new kind of business model where it was bringing in um, very high-tech product development, consulting, and education um, as elements that we would exercise in the business. Um, and I was developing this very new product, Grow, which was the hybrid solar and wind device, uh, and my product really fit well within the product arm of the business. Um, we then presented that idea to the Pratt Design Incubator um, and the business plan, which was very early on in terms of what, compared to what it is now. Um, and we're able to get a space in the incubator, which fostered um, us in, in many different ways. It put us in an environment and a network of people that we could ask many challenging questions, um, dealing with the unknown that was in front of us for starting a business uh, and develop a product um, it also gave us resources within the university that we could exercise. Um, and we were able to use our grant writers to write a grant for the National Collegiate Innovators and Inventors Alliance, which is a part of the Lummelson Foundation. And we were able to develop our idea into a proof of concept and finally a product. Um, and so it was fairly early on, it was more research-based and turned into a company and a, and a product. So it sounds like your university experience was really helpful to you when the university very, launched very. you. How can students find out about those kinds of resources? You know, I would try and, and be as uh, diverse in, in, in who you're finding in your, in your university as possible. Uh, and, and finding the, the different organizations that could be of use to you in your university. Um, I was in the industrial design program. My business partner is in the architecture program at Pratt. And, typically those two departments don't really speak to each other. Um, the architecture guys are in their studio for 24 hours a day, typically, and, and we were in our studios for 24 hours a day, developing our ideas in isolation. And I feel that if you can have a very interdisciplinary approach to the people that you're talking to, whether it's your friends um, or the different professors, and, and sharing your ideas and, 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 and maximizing the resources that are there within the student body, the faculty, and the administration. And really, sharing your idea can create opportunities. And so while it felt like we were in the right place at the right time, by voicing what we wanted to do, we were able to find the opportunities and the connections that we needed. And then it ended up feeling very ser serendipitous. Roxanne. You started Burt's Bees in 1989, and how many people know Burt's Bees and have used their products? I love their products, wonderful. Um, and the company has been so successful, both financially as well as on the environmental side. Um, tell us a little bit more about the environmental side of the achievements of the company. Okay, well they're quite interlinked, um, but the product category we were in was personal care products. And we took a look at where the opportunities were there. It's a very crowded space. About 5,000 new products are introduced every year. It's as you can probably visualize by going to a drugstore or a grocery store, there's a lot of choices out there. And as we looked at the opportunities, it appeared pretty clear that 
we needed to solve two problems that were completely unsustainable in this um, personal care space. And one of them was packaging, and um, the other one was uh, the dependence of petroleum for the products within a petroleum-based package. So plastics, Anita, <laughs> we were um, dealing with the same issue, which was a completely petroleum-dependent um, industry. And we uh, needed to solve that for in our way, both because we didn't believe we could add to the problem, and also because it allowed us to create a niche for ourselves that wasn't currently being exploited. And were the environmental core values of the company, were those explicit from the beginning, or did they evolve over time? Well, they were refined over time. And we learned more and more about the implications of what we did, and we were always in a, a betterment mode, trying to learn from mistakes and get better and better. But I am a core environmentalist, and um, there would be no way that I could, with the uh, need to fulfill my own personal values, get into a situation where I was m attempting to profit from something that wasn't sustainable on the earth and for people. So it was always part of my vision. And the marketing of that vision through the product we know as Burt's Bees was an effort to both communicate the values of the product and communicate the values of the company and try to make them as simple as possible so that they would be understood by the majority of Americans. And that was a problem we felt that we need to have 80% of Americans acting in a very environmentally responsible way and not the 20%. And we felt that we could meet the uh, largest group of consumers with these relatively low cost personal care products and every time they would read the package or use it, they would be reminded of a closed system and a sustainable system. Did you ever encounter any, any trade-offs that you had to make between economic success of a product and the environmental impact? And how did you make that kind of a trade-off and decision? Well, I'm not a very compromising person, so <laughs> I uh, don't like making trade-offs between two valuable um, um, missions. And one was profitability. That was a very high value in the company. And the other was environmental sustainability. So we needed to find a way where we could do both. One challenge we had, one of the most difficult challenges we faced where we were looking at the temptation to make a trade-off was with a very popular product, lotion. It's a category that if you're going to be a household name in all the stores, you really need to have a lotion. And the difficulty for us with lotion was it, they're always packaged in plastic, and we were using no plastic packaging, and they always have a high petroleum and water content, which means that you had to preserve them. Uh, because the water allowed organisms to grow unless you used basically what's a, it's a pesticide or an insecticide. It kills living organisms within the product. And we were not willing to use those products in the, in the contents. So it was a real dilemma because we were, you know, that it was worth five to ten million dollars a year in sales and we weren't doing it and we knew we had to. So what the, the, the uh, solution we arrived at was post-consumer recycled plastic bottles. So in many ways, we were creating a demand, much like Anita was mentioning, for the used plastic commodity. We were pretty small, and we teamed up with a great company, you probably know them, Aveda, who was also, they were about four times bigger than we were, and they were creating a demand for post-consumer recycled plastic. So the plastic, you know, injection mold molding companies were, oh, okay, well, maybe we can get three, 400,000 bottles out of an order, and so they started to listen. And we were 
quite innovators in that. We really had to pull it out of the vendors to use post-consumer recycled plastic because they all told you how it would ruin their machines and the rest of it, but um, that wasn't true at all. And then the contents of the lotion being water, we were not using any of those harsh chemicals that kill organisms. And um, that was a real challenge for our, our lab and our chemist. And he came up with the most amazing preservative system that used lactose, which is an ingredient in milk, and it consumed the organisms. I'm, real, I'm talking very simply. If you're scientists, you probably <laughs> think that this is quite an elementary uh, interpretation, but they somehow consume the organisms that want to grow in an environment where there's a lot of water and nutrients. And um, we were able to make the lotion. And we waited, it was kind of wrenching because we knew we were leaving money on the table, but I really felt that Burt's Bees had set a standard for ourselves and something for the consumer to um, uh, expect from us, and I never wanted to let that consumer down. I always wanted to please them with the choices we made for them. And you sold the company a few years ago to Clorox, is that right? Yeah, in a roundabout way. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, in 2003, I sold 80% of the company to a private equity company out of New York. I was looking to um, sort of uh, share the responsibilities of the company with other financial investors, and um, I felt that we could grow more professionally, perhaps. I, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an artist. I was never trained to run a company, and I was the CEO and president, and it was, you know, starting to become a larger entity than I wanted to manage. And I, I uh, found a fabulous company to work for, which was a major decision, and if you're ever in that position to sell a percentage of a company, you want to be sure you really love those people that are going to partner with you because uh, the level of trust that needs to develop is um, very high, especially if you're an entrepreneur and kind of used to doing things your own way and that sort of thing. So they, I worked as the CEO of the company for one year post, um, post sale, and they brought in uh, another CEO. That was our agreement so that I could um, back out of the day-to-day -day operations. I served on their board, and then I, at that point, had 20% of the company, so basically I was dragged along. You know, the, um, the majority partners identified Clorox as, an, as, as a possible uh, acquirer, and so that was a decision that they made mostly because they were the highest bidder, um, and they really maximized the return, and I was very, very happy for uh, their accomplishments, and... Um, yeah, so that's the acquisition story. And briefly, what are you doing now? Well, most of the um, revenues of the sale of the company went into three foundations. We have a private operating foundation, which acquires and conserves wilderness lands in the state of Maine, and we've expanded now to acquire in-holdings in various national parks that are not completely owned by the Park Service. So we're buying them for the parks to donate to the Park Service on its 100th anniversary in 2016. So we're, we're doing that as a private operating foundation. We also have a family foundation that grants um, to uh, access to the arts and access to recreation and outdoor activities in the state of Maine as well. And uh, we have a charitable remainder trust, which is basically rolling into the family foundation right now. So, you know, I felt that that was a way of keeping the values of the company going because, of course, when you sell the company, you lose control over it. And I did not have, you know, any say in how the day-to-day -day affairs of product development, manufacturing, or any of that was going to be run. So I felt it was really important for me to take the resources that it, it created for me and for... Um, the company and invest those in the same values that Burt's Bees had when I was developing the company. So I felt that that was really critical. And I'm really glad, you know, I mean, obviously you regret when you, when you sell a company, it's your baby, you know, they go off to college and you wonder if they're going to be okay. 
but this has given the the what the consumer wanted and loved about Burt's Bees lives on in the environmental work that we're doing, I believe. And uh, that's what I'm doing right now. And with some staff here that are here today are helping enormously in carrying out. There's one thing I would tell you that as a business person, it's very hard for me to adjust to the nonprofit world because it's, you know, running a really fast growing company where we were growing sometimes 35, 45% a year, you're pretty focused and um, moving into a nonprofit category where I'm learning that relationships are amazingly important. I didn't take a lot of time for relationship building as I was growing Burt's Bees. I, I was just, you know, on the line pushing, pushing uh, cost of goods down, sales up, and uh, the nonprofit world does work in, uh, with harmonious relationships as being a really high value of the inter enterprise. So that's a real adjustment for me, and I'm learning that from my great staff here who have worked in the nonprofit world for their careers and have a lot to teach me about that. And finally, do you have any summer internship openings possibly this summer? Well, we need some baristas up in Maine for mm -hmm. the summer, if you like. All right. <laughs> or you can talk to Dan. He might, yeah. Dan, you raise are, your hand. You are okay. looking for some interns, aren't you? Right. Yep, for the uh, interview process for our grant applicants. Ooh, that sounds fun. Yeah. Um, and Sam, I forgot to ask you, are you looking for interns this summer? Yeah, we have a long list, uh, if, and it's mostly open towards engineering and MBA students. So if you have interest in working in, a, in the solar or wind field, send us an email, your resume. Great. So um, a, another question for everyone on the panel. Um, you all have amazing stories. I don't know about you all, but I was totally inspired. It sounds so fun and so glamorous. But give us the dirt. What's it really like to be an entrepreneur? What's hard about it? What should people really think about as they're considering whether entrepreneurship is the right path for them? Understanding the definition of stability. Everybody asks that. Do you feel stable? In a business, it's very difficult to feel stable. You may have orders for the next two months, three months, but the markets are changing quickly. And um, there always seems to be a cash flow problem. So you're kind of on the edge. So you don't see, uh, experience something like stability uh, and also the community that you work with, the workers, the different levels of workers, their demands. It's kind of a, uh, you're, I don't know, very edgy. Mm -hmm. I feel like that. I, I would agree to, to some degree. And the, one of the elements of it is that you have to be very tenacious with all of those up, ups and downs and keep your focus on the motivation behind why you started that journey. Um, another aspect is, is to, you know, you know, there there is that uncertainty in the future and this unknown unknown out there, and to fail quickly and often and safely if you can is really important. And so for for us, we had this time with a grant really early on where we could try out very crazy ideas. Uh, and test them and constantly be iterating, and we still do that in our office with new products, with business models, and test them with other either advisors who we've had from the MBA or business backgrounds or with other designers in our network and are able to get feedback and learn as quickly as possible because, you know, you're going off into the unknown, and for all of us, we've started businesses in a niche space where the research doesn't apply. And so you have to create your own benchmarks and your own goals and then constantly be going towards them. And it may feel like you're a ship without a, how to port, but you know that, that if you face, if you do your work and you know how to track the, the, the sun and the stars, you'll be able to get to the right place. And so learning how to do that, learning all of those little bits about the company and about the technology that you might be using or the idea that you might have and, and who the players might be, who can help you in that space. Can you share something with them without them going off and, and saying, oh, they had a really terrible idea, but get the effective feedback and, and move and, op and you know, change your plan and constantly be evolving with it. Um, you know, we look very different now than when we started and it's a process <laughs> and, 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 it's, and, it, and at times you feel like you're on the edge, but it's great. 
Well, I'm obviously passion and hard work are enormous. Passion bordering on obsession, I think, in a certain way. But I would like to talk about one other quality that is often overlooked, and that's why I'd like to bring it up, and it's uh, called intuition. And that, to me, is that saying that the answers are always inside. They're always inside, and they're always available to be reached and brought into the conscious mind where you can evaluate them in the real world and test them. And I don't believe we give enough um, attention or credit to developing our intuition, um, or perhaps we just don't have the words to talk about it. But I, I know that we always talk about women's intuition. I think women are particularly sensitive to sort of the nonverbal cues that are out there and their own feelings and sentiments and, and, and pay attention to them. And perhaps the younger generation of men are being taught to do that as well. Um, and I think that anything that you can do when facing a challenge that your left brain is not unlocking for you is to go over to the right brain, to go into a quieter mode through meditation or through exercise or yoga or um, a quiet space and see what comes up. Allow the answers to kind of bubble up and enrich your view of the situation that you're dealing with. So don't forget that. It's really easy to overlook. It's a very quiet process, but it, it has enormous potential for helping you find a, what your way on basically what is a new path, as you described it. Mm -hmm. There's no rules out there. If somebody was already doing it, the opportunity wouldn't be there for exactly. you. So you're on your own journey. And, and, and looking within is a very important part of illuminating that journey for yourself. We have time just for one more question, and I wanted to mention that my organization, Net Impact's mission is to help people build careers that change the world. We have a number of uh, career resources on our website, netimpact.org, um, and I wanted to end on a very practical, tangible note with some advice for you all as you're considering what you're going to do next. I bet a lot of you are looking for internships, a lot of you are looking for full-time jobs, so we'll have the panel offer some advice, and um, I'll, I'll start. Um, my first advice um, for you is to meet people. Did you all know that the majority of jobs actually are never even posted? They come from meeting people and networking and making yourself stand out from the crowd. So if you haven't already met someone here in the past few days that can help you, um, you've got three amazing people right here. Please come meet them after the panel or someone else. So that's my advice to you. Sorry, guys. I uh, hope you weren't trying to leave right after the panel. But um, what else do we have to tell to our audience? I think... Uh you sh during student days, I know you, all, you will take a lot of loans, but it's good to save a little money because sometimes internships, uh, everybody wants to go to, uh, say, China, India, but these cities have also become very expensive, and we get a lot of letters from interns, but they've not saved any money, so it just becomes difficult. And I feel resume and international, uh, you know, like India, China, being on the resume is becoming very, very important. And uh, so, and also for your own personal growth, it kind of creates a layered personality. Like when you're speaking to anyone, and then you just mention because you know incidents uh, and experiences help you in your conversation. And then you say, "Oh, this happened," and the other person says, "Oh, you did that." I mean, they may not say it openly, but you can see it from their look that you know. So this kind of a layered response in a conversation, it. And is, this can only come through experiences. And experiences can only come if you have been traveling and meeting new people and trying out different things. And not as a tourist, but as a, you know, somebody belonging to that world. I think all this really helps. Absolutely. I would add, uh, choose things that really inspire you to the point of action. Um, and whatever it might be, and, and even if it ends in, in uh, on a dead end road, you know that you've followed your gut and followed that intuition. And you'll feel whole in what you've learned getting there. And that will be a reward in itself. And if you can find that you're then getting the job or you have a company that's doing somewhat well from that, it, it, it will fuel your, fi your fire even more and it'll bring the passion and everything else. And so I would really push for all of you who, you're coming out of college, 
your life in general is at low risk right now, which is like the perfect time to pursue the crazy ideas that you may have. Um, and that's another thing that I could add is that, you know, I. I started my company right out of school. I'd worked professionally um, while in school. And I had very low risk. I didn't have any kids. I didn't have a mortgage. I had a college loans. But those were able to be dealt with with, with a lot of hard work. Um, so you know, go after it right now. Um, and that's really what I have to share. Well, I'm really hesitant to give any advice. <laughs> Um, but I guess as a person who came of age in the 60s and absorbed the cultural revolution that was going on there at that time, I was living in San Francisco and going to art school and really changing my whole outlook on the way I was going to live my life as a, as a departure from the way I was brought up. Um, and one of our slogans of the time was to follow your bliss. And I always felt that was something I was going to do. I was always going to follow my bliss. And as an artist, it was essential for me to do that, to maintain the freedom in my life so that I could follow the various paths that presented that seemed interesting. So I, I never got involved with loans or mortgages or car payments or any of those things because I, I needed to keep the freedom intact. And I guess if I were going to give advice, that would be the advice that I would give. Just keep as much flexibility in your life, especially in the age that you are now. Keep as much flexibility in your life as you can because you're in a very exploratory stage right now. It's best if you have the freedom to pursue all kinds of little, maybe even dead ends, that they, you'll learn something from them. Thank you. And now we have time for some questions from the audience. So if you have a question, um, I think raise your hand. And there's, I think there are mics. Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> Were they maintained? Are they still up to the standards that you had? Or have they, are they using non-recycled plastic now and things like that? Well, I have not worked in the company since 2004. And I don't really know whether they are upholding the original formulas. I would think that with higher speed filling and higher quantities, they've had to modify them perhaps. We had a pretty small operation where we were able to kind of do kitchen cosmetics. And I'm sure that by now the numbers are higher and they have perhaps changed the formulas. But I really don't know that for sure one way or the other. But nothing about the use of plastics or anything like that? You know, I guess. I took a very simple approach, and that was that they bought the company, and it was theirs to do what they needed to do with it, and that I would ensure that the values of the company as I understood them as, and as I wanted to perpetuate them, I had the control to do that with the proceeds of the sale. And that's how I kept things in balance in my own mind. We have another question over here. Um, my name is Hong, and I have uh, started a uh, enterprise in Eastern Kentucky in Appalachia. And uh, I, um, you all talked about the stability and the challenges that you go through. And um, it's been really hard this past uh, two years that I've been involved in this project, but. I was asking you especially to Samuel and uh, Anita, um, is there any time when you will find a, a stability or a point where like you feel comfortable with the company that's running smooth and or you or is it always a rush and are you always going to be in the edge, always trying to like come up with something new, trying to like uh, develop new relationships, new products or like uh, trying to uh, expand the company? So um, is there a time where like you find that stability or you have to like uh, uh, make yourself really comfortable with ambiguity, uncertainty, and the unknown. Uh, you can talk about that. There are phases when you feel you have arrived, you're comfortable, you're secure, and the workers around you are happy. 
but it is uh, it, it's a short because uh, it's a very short duration because you are on the uphill you're on the you're climbing it up and you're growing it so there are all kinds of problems but the thing is that you know you're making your own milestones you're charting your own path and so it's a very interesting journey and you just learn to live on the edge because you have chosen that you can there's always as soon as a company grows a little bit also you start getting investor interest so i admi really admire her what she has done because we have ha we have also had continuous investor interest but somehow we are resisting it maybe because i feel we have the steam still and the time when it comes that uh, no like uh, i'm also an artist and i want to now i can't take it any longer because there are there are lots of pressures and stress points but at times the journey is very nice like this is a moment i'm really enjoying you feel oh you know you have you've been invited on a stage to talk about uh, your uh, concepts and so it's it's an interesting but i would feel why take an easy path why not take the tough path you have the energy you have the you have everything going for you all why not take it like one of the questions which really used to i used to wonder like india it has not uh, designed anything a new design which the world is using in the last 100 years okay we created the zero and we did uh, all the things in the past <laughs> but you know and we use so many products right from toothbrush in the morning to telephones to mobile phones to electricity to computers television but there's no design which india created and the problem becomes when you are not creating new products you are not giving employment because the designers have to create and the rest of the population they are like herds they'll follow you create employment so it's very important that if you have even a little bit of a creativity in you it's worth taking the hardship because there are others uh, who and, and especially like we work with the poorest of the poor they had no choices so compared to the stress that i face in maybe with the buyers or the courier service or something like that it's nothing compared to the problems that they have faced in life so if you keep in mind the three bottom lines that i have to be financially profitable and what i am doing is really supporting a good cause it could be women children schools healthcare employment training anything and of course the environment then end of the day you think that i have achieved something yeah i, I yeah <laughs> I would add one little bit is that when you feel that stability, I would probably not be in the company anymore. I, I, I crave that, that wanting to grow something and be on the edge of the idea or of what, the realm of what's possible because that's, that's what excites me. I, if, it's, if it's very stable, I probably won't be there. One more question, I think. Hi, uh, yeah, my name's Ben. Um, we talked a lot about internships and stuff today, but as entrepreneurs, I think we can all agree that we're trying to find the best team possible for our projects. Can you tell us a bit about what you look for in uh, creating a strong team or what you look for in creating your team? Uh, I, I can add to that. Because um, we've been building our team fairly recently. Um, what I look for at all levels is, is the ability to have divergent thinking um, in, the, in, in being able to pull from very various experiences in their past and, and pull them at whatever might be the problem that we're dealing with at that day or on that hour or that minute. Um, it, it's something that is fairly common in creative minds, so we're always looking for that. And then you know, a focus or a strength in, in multiple areas um, then becomes a part of like, the qualities or the qualifications that we're hiring around. Um, but really, like, the base ability to pull from both the emotional aspect and the rational side of your brain and then from all the various experiences is a really important aspect of how we build our teams. Uh, how about one more question? The microphone people are deciding. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, hi. I just had a question about um, kind of just uh, creating socially progressive movements that have started from, I guess, especially with, for you, Anita, what you, um, you said you incorporated like people who 
pick up scraps and stuff like that. So have you started maybe type of any like education or like any type of s community based like clean up in Delhi? Uh, yes, we support a school where uh, during Commonwealth Games or you know like Delhi is also becoming like in any other international city. There's no place for poor and there's no place for slums at all. So demolishing a slum is easy because they're anyway living in cardboard boxes. So a bulldozer comes and demolishes it. And they're pushed out at the edge of, the, of Delhi. And nobody wants them. And they're completely unskilled. They, they, where they settle in is uh, where there's no infrastructure. There's no education. There's no health care. There's no road. There's just nothing out there. So that's how they start their life. So we, we have started a school. It, it supports 200 children, but there, I know there are at least 10,000 children who are wanting to go to school. But we are a, since we are a small organization, we are taking our own small initiatives, but we are working with the government. We are pushing the government uh, to get uh, some laws passed. So we are trying in our own way. I think we have time for a quick question um, with the timer here. Hello, uh, I have a question to Samuel. Um, uh, I know that you create uh, an energy efficient product, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as a company, do you track your footprint and uh, how sustainable you are as a company in your management and operational production? Yes, we do. So we've um, been going about the process of designing our systems to use minimal material and uh, efficient processes in the development of our products. Um, so that, that, that mindset comes in at the very onset of us creating a new product. Um, and we use rapid prototyping machines, which allow for us to really test out these ideas without making a huge footprint um, in soft tooling or these other things that would have to be updated later on. Um, our office does the same. We're, we're located um, at, in kind of like the graduating room of the design incubator, which is a, a, a space for s sustainable and social innovation. Um, so everything in that office also is under green power, and we recycle everything that we have there. So we bring in. Um, those metrics also with our manufacturers. We use contract manufacturers at the moment. And so we found good partners that are adopting some of those same metrics and we're applying our own metrics to them um, to, as, our, you know, as a part of vetting them as to whether we want to partner with them or not. Um, and because we've created a market that is fairly niche in the solar industry, we, we have um, a large draw for, for those relationships and, and bring a lot to the table for that. So now you've heard from our amazing panelists and they've shared their stories and experiences and now it's time to hear from you. So what we're gonna do for the next 10 to 15 minutes or so is have table discussions. So we'd like you to talk with each other. What are your ideas? What are the next steps? What are the questions you have? Um, we're gonna go sit amongst you and then um, we'll call you back, your attention back up here in a little bit and report back what we heard. All right, so thanks everyone. It's great to see so much animated discussion. We're just gonna wrap up um, with some thoughts up here and get you out in plenty of time for good seats for John Stewart and President Clinton. Um, so let's start with Anita. What did you learn at your table? I met Christina. I met Christina. Christina, can you wave out? Yes. And they have started an upcycling uh, unit in their uh, University of Central Florida. And she's given me a small souvenirs, which I'll take back to India. And I've invited her to come to India and we can work together, the two organizations. <laughs> but I'm really glad, glad with all that talk, what was going on, very enthusiastic crowd. <laughs> right, Sam. Uh, I met a few people who are working with a central theme of bringing together local constituents around their ideas. So one of them was a rooftop garden, another one is a, a way of empowering local agriculture through a credit system, um, and then another one was for having petitions come together and fundraising kind of like a Kickstarter for green technology and algae. Um, so really interesting ideas. I hope I am connecting them with a few other uh, possible um, people in my network, so you know it's one of those things where you can just again put the idea out there and see what comes through. 
great and rushed in. I ended up talking with Shamar, and Shamar has a uh, idea for a personal care product that I thought was quite interesting. I had heard that there is a demand for this particular kind of product, so it appears that that uh, is not being filled. Obviously, there's some opportunities there. But I thought the most interesting part of our conversation was about feminism. And one of the things that um, a woman can do as she uh, achieves success in her career is to provide an example for other women. We're all standing on the shoulders of, of our predecessors, in especially in the world of business and, and uh, the opportunities that are available for women. And we did talk about the fact that our industry, the personal care industry, was particularly inspiring for women. And a woman of color ended up being a multimillionaire with a uh, personal care product company back in the late 1800s. And of course, we've all heard of Estee Lauder and Helena Rubinstein and other women who were allowed by our culture to enter this space of personal care and n not encounter a glass ceiling. And I think that probably that's the most important cultural value other than the environmental values that we observe, but also as women in this industry uh, holding ourselves uh, as an example for other women who need more executive level women um, uh, role models. And, and I, th I, you know, I'm a lot older than you guys, so this is probably more <laughs> of a problem for my generation, hopefully not for yours, but that's what we ended up talking about. It was a very interesting conversation. Well, I'm going to let you all out just a few minutes early um, because I know some of you are dying to come talk to my fellow panelists. I encourage you to do that. Um, thank you all so much for coming today into this whole conference, and we'll see you next year.